If we switch gears a bit, uh, we do, our group does specialize uh, scolio pilates and uh, scoliosis specific exercise. And that was founded out of, again, my own spine. Having had surgery, I didn't know I had scoliosis. And the spine surgeon said, oh, by the way, you have scoliosis. I said, well, doesn't everybody? <laughs> he wrote in my chart, irritable. <laughs> and so I, uh, after the surgery, I did get some use of my leg back. Well, quite a bit of use of my leg back. But the scoliosis um, destabilized, it got worse. And so hence we created this um, exercise form. And, and as we go through and I look at the muscles, they just don't function the way that we would expect a muscle to function. And there's so many studies out there that, that state that, you know, this muscle is doing this and this, uh, this muscle is weak, this muscle is um, strong, or this one's activating, this one's not activating. However, I've had the privilege to do just a couple of scoliosis dissections and, and it doesn't appear that the muscles are, um, t in terms of texture, terribly different. Is it possible that the um, muscles are just serving a different stabilizing type of function and just not doing what we expect them to do physiologically due to the rotations? It, it, it's a fabulous question. I know exactly where you're, you're coming from. Uh, I str strongly suspect that that's the case, as you've just uh, uh, stated it. But now we have to get into a discussion of what's cause and what's effect. Mm -hmm. Was there something unusual about the muscles that promoted a odd deviation resulting in scoliosis? or have the muscles now responded to something else? So I'll let the world know that I have scoliosis as well. Um, I, it's a bit developmental, but uh, perhaps not. I had a hockey stick go through my rib cage when oh, I was a younger yeah. fellow, and my ribs are now fused on this side. So when I'm teaching a course on assessment, I'll have someone put their fingers interdigitating into my intercostal muscles, and then mm -hmm. I'll breathe. And then what they will notice is this rib cage is elastic and it expands. Hence, this lung has much more capacity for expansion and contraction. But this rib cage through these ribs through here, it, it doesn't really work anymore. So what I've developed, and the more I breathe, I have <laughs> more scoliosis. Yeah. Um, so that's a developmental scoliosis. And then I'll get another patient who comes in with, with scoliosis and they have the same apparent breathing mechanism where one rib cage is really uh, opening up with bucket handle dynamics and the other isn't. And there's no trouble Look at their x-ray and their heart is biased on the other side. And for some reason, God just put their heart on, on a different side. So the lungs are not normal. So when they breathe, they've got a baby lung and a, and a larger lung. Who knows what caused that? Maybe it was just that's the way they were made from birth. So their rib cage has developed as they went through challenged breathing, and it built a, a curve. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was cause and effect there? I, it, you know, it becomes such an interesting discussion. Um, but then uh, I have to, my world isn't, you know, groups of back pain people. It's always a single person. So mm -hmm. we'll bring in that single person and try and understand uh, their mechanics. Uh, I'm sure that the muscles change. So not only do the muscles change their vector direction. So consider my external oblique. My external oblique causes left axial rotation, it causes right lateral bend, and it causes flexion. So it has action about all of those three axes. Well, if, if I uh, develop quite severe scoliosis, I've, I've changed that vector direction. But the second part that people don't talk about very often is the length tension curve. So when we take a muscle like a bicep, which crosses my shoulder and my elbow, I have a, an ability to create maximum force about there. Mm -hmm. But if I change my shoulder, I've shortened the muscle, the strength curve actually increases at a bigger 
uh, elbow angle, if you know what I mean. So muscles produce force as a function of length. Well, you really change and modulate that force length relationship in a created spine. So we don't know anymore, not only is it vector direction, but the force potential has changed. Muscles are elastic. They don't have to be neurally driven through nerve signals to create force if they're stretched. So these are the fantastic dynamics that make scoliosis so um, interesting in a case-by-case -case study. But I think the seminal question for you and for me is, are we able to change it? Can we possibly help these people? So uh, what we do is we hang them from a bar. And if their scoliosis straightens, we'll say, you know, mechanically, you have the ability to straighten. And that really is the green light for us. Let's try some Schroth. So you were talking about silly stretches. Well, they're not silly anymore. If they are dressing uh, the tension balance that you're talking about, can we stretch those on the convex side? Can we add a bit more uh, stiffness or turgidity on the ones on the uh, outside of the curve? And can we help them? Well, again, I told you we follow up with people. I'm thinking of one professional um, defensive halfback in, in, in football. And uh, his deviation was growing. Uh, he was able to reverse it through strategic stretching and strengthening and creating that balance. Uh, as you know, sometimes uh, is it a leg length issue? Is it uh, an imbalance in the psoas that is causing a rotation in the pelvis, mm -hmm. um, or is it a foot falling into in, inversion, eversion, inversion, and driving the knee into valgus, pinching <laughs> the, the hip and internal rotation, twisting mm -hmm. the pelvis. I mean, we live in a linkage. So some of these things are really interesting to, to try and figure out. Um, anyway, there, there's a beginning of uh, that particular uh, discussion. Um, can I just give you one more thing to finish the whole discussion? When I think of the people who come and ask for my consult on scoliosis, and I admitted right on, out at the beginning, I'm not the uh, expert in, in scoliosis. Uh, however, um, they have back pain, and that's where my expertise does lie. Um, there's two times in a person's lifespan when I think people like myself and perhaps you really have a chance to modify this. And one is, is during adolescence, during the growth phase. And the second time is the person is now retired and either they're going to lose their fitness, their occupational fitness, or they're going to regain their fitness. So their job, they were a desk jockey, now they want to ride their bike and really, I'm fitter now that <laughs> I've retired because I get a chance to work at it than when I was a slave to the desk as a, as a professor. I think of one uh, patient that I saw not too long ago, you're not gonna believe this, but he was a surgeon. And he came to see me with his back pain. And his real love now, he would hump over the, the uh, uh, operating table doing complicated spine surgery for mm -hmm. two or three hours. That built tremendous endurance. He had occupational fitness in his back. He quit that. He lost his mm -hmm. stiffness and muscle strength in his back. But the scoliosis really started to develop now because he became weak. And as he breathed, he breathed through that dominant lung and the scoliosis just took off. Yeah. So it was so important for him now. We had to restore first and foremost back fitness. Yeah. And then he was able to build capacity to ride without this huge asymmetry. Yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, do you find that where this, the, the second time we have to be vigilant for scoliosis is post-retirement? Well, you know, we deal with so many women because while men and 
males and females have um, scoliosis at an equal rate, women are much more likely to progress. And so for women who we see most of the time, it's going to be adolescence, pregnancy, and menopause. So menopause is a bit before retirement, but yes, those are the three times in a woman's life that we have to be very vigilant of what's happening with the scoliosis. Um, but with men, yes, they're, they'll be closer to retirement. And whether menopause and andropause, men, andropause will come closer to retirement, women, menopause is before retirement. So it's a bit of a toss up. But I love your point that I could potentially be more fit once I retire because I am finding myself being a bit of um, a screen addict these days. And I, I had that app on or I had that capacity on my phone to tell me how many hours I was on the screen between my computer and my phone. I had to turn it off. It was too depressing. You know, it's just like, I thought I was super active, you know, walking the dog and riding my bike. And then it's still telling me that I'm at my screen eight hours a day. And I thought, no, this can't possibly be true. And of course, of course it is. But uh, yeah, so the video. You know, Karina, I, I hate to admit this, um, people said, oh, why are you retiring? We, we need you and that kind of thing from the university. And I said, for my health. Yeah. When I first started at the university, people don't realize this. Personal computers weren't invented yet. You know, you typed your thesis on a typewriter. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we wrote letters by hand. But, you know, students came to office hours. We were walking around. It was a very dynamic job. Then, with the advent of the personal computer, we became a slave to that. And then students even wanted to say, well, can I just email you? And I said, no, I come to office hours, get moving, get off the screen. Um, and then the university encouraged it with online, this and that. Anyway, I got to the point where I was becoming so unhealthy, being a slave to the computer because of my job. I said, this isn't worth it anymore. And uh, now the first thing I do, I get out of bed in the morning and I go for a walk with my dog. What a great way to start the day. And then, uh, you know, I might do an hour's worth of computing and then I go and do something else and uh, I might uh, see a patient. And do you know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. lovely to restore that physical balance back into my life. And I'm, I have no pain now. I feel fabulous, but I had pain when I was a professor. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's hard to uh, take the time to follow your own advice. I've certainly experienced that. Yeah. Well, don't leave it too late. Uh, a very wise professor, in fact, it was the professor who started our department, a fellow named Norm Ashton. He said, my one advice to you, and this is when I was first hired at the university, he says, don't stay until you get sick. Uh, yeah, I like that. <laughs> and, and, and I thought about that. And uh you know, I've outlived my father now, and uh, it's, uh, but I, I absolutely feel fabulous, and uh, honestly, I don't miss the university and the computer one little bit. Yeah, yeah. and I see you do have quite a travel schedule as well. You uh, were in Australia recently, and I see your next workshop is in Canada, but after that, you're heading overseas again? Uh, yeah, I'm really winding down uh, my travel. And uh, it, it's uh, that there's that there's just more to to life now. I enjoy seeing patients here, and we, we have a little uh, master clinician mentorship that we do here. Well, fantastic. Um, pardon? That sounds fantastic. Yeah. So I'm I'm not so keen. I, I spent 30 years on the road once a month uh, traveling somewhere. That was my uh, the, the limit I used to put on. <laughs> anyway. Yeah.